our next speaker, um, who is hopefully ready for us, um, is Victoria, Victoria Morris. She's presenting a paper on uh, developing machine learning tools to detect the language of legacy catalogue records. The paper is titled Closing the Language Gap. Victoria is a metadata analyst working within the metadata standards team at the British Library. She specializes in data transformations and working with large data sets. Uh, Will will be showing her slides for her. Thank you. Hello, I'm Victoria Morris. I work as a metadata analyst in the metadata standards team at the British Library. My presentation is going to be about a language identification project that I've been working on for the past three years or so. I'll explain more about what my project entails over the next few slides. But what I will say at this point is that although I'm focusing on language identification in particular, I hope to be able to explain some of how the tools and techniques covered here could be used in other projects in your institution or in other, other disciplines. So the first question to ask is, what do we mean by language identification? Well, language identification and language detection are pretty much used synonymously, and they just mean working out what language something is in. The texts that we analyse are typically referred to as documents. These may be written or spoken texts, although in this context, I'm only going to focus on written texts. Throughout the history of language identification, it tends to be the case that the documents analysed have been quite lengthy. So newspaper articles, whole books, Wikipedia articles, that sort of thing. But with the advent of newer technologies, including Twitter and text messaging, language identification has been applied to shorter texts, which will prove to be quite useful for our purposes. So the British Library holds millions of resources and we have metadata records describing those resources. As of 2017, 4.6 million of those metadata records didn't include any information about what language the resource was written in. Typically, those metadata records are part of our legacy metadata. So they describe collections that have perhaps been inherited from the British Museum or other older collections. And back in the days of the British Museum Library, the catalogue was pretty much held in the librarian's head and a user who wanted to find all of the Persian books relating to geometry of the circle, for example, would go to the librarian, tell him or her what they wanted, and the librarian would go and find the books. So there was no need to ever write down which books were in Persian and which were in Arabic and, and so on. But that's not good enough in the modern day and age. Our users want to be able to use the online catalogue to search by language, to refine, filter and facet their searching by language. And when they pull up a rec metadata record, they expect to be able to see information about the language of content. So on the right hand side of this slide, you can see an example of a metadata record describing a book which is evidently written in a non-Roman alphabet. And the information in the metadata record tells us that this book is written in Oromo, which is really quite useful because if you don't speak Oromo, you might not recognise that alphabet and you might not know how to begin finding out what the content of the book says. You can't just copy and paste that into Google Translate. So what can we do about this? Well, 4.6 million things is really rather a lot. And although we want to do something about it, we really can't go and take each book off the shelf individually and work out what language it's in. And this would probably take about 4.6 million years. It looks like we're going to have to use a computer. There are two main avenues of approach. One is linguistic modelling, which is where we make a detailed analysis of the grammatical or semantic structure of a language. And this might include the morphological properties of words, or it might include the alphabets the diacritics used. For example, if we know that in Welsh, the beginnings of nouns mutate in a particular way, we might be able to use that information to help us identify which documents are written in Welsh. On the other hand, Statistical modelling is a much more abstract approach. So we analyse features, but without worrying about the semantics, we don't worry at all about what things mean. Instead, we look at sequences of adjacent characters, perhaps words, or perhaps sequences of words, but in a totally abstract way. 
So this is a bit like saying we know that E is the most common letter in the English language. So if we have a document written in English, we might expect to see a lot of E's present. Similarly, if we find a document which contains a lot of instances of the letter K, then we might wonder whether that document is written in Finnish. As you might expect, linguistic modelling is by far the more realistic of the approaches, but it's also incredibly complicated because it requires you to find a way to take all that detailed linguistic information and somehow programming it into a computer. And that pretty much confines us to the statistical approach because we need to find a way to tackle this problem using an ordinary desktop PC. However, if we're taking this approach, we should bear in mind that because it's such an abstract approach, it might be a bit naive. And we should remember that when we are looking at the results that the statistical model gives us. So what a statistical model means is we build some sort of model or template using records where we do have information about language of content. Whenever we have a record that doesn't include language information, we compare it to the model and see which language we think it might be. Then we can make a prediction, otherwise known as a guess, about what language the unknown document is written in. Effectively, we're building a shape sorter. We look at all the records where we have language information. We discover that all of the French records are triangular, all of the Italian records are square, and all of the Jongo records are circular. Then when we come across a record where we don't have any language information, we discover that it fits into the square hole. So maybe this book is written in Italian. Bear in mind as I'm saying this that you might not be modeling language, you could model any property of metadata in this way. So one example of a statistical model would be rank order statistics. You rank all of the words present in each language by the frequency of their occurrence. In fact, you don't have to do this because you can probably find a corpus on the internet that will tell you which words are most common in each language. Then you take all of your records where you don't have language information, rank the words by frequency of occurrence, compare them to the model, and you might hope that documents which rank words in the same order might well be written in the same language. Unfortunately, this doesn't really work for short documents. So on the left of the diagram, we have a profile for the English language, with the most common words being the, b, to, of, and, and a. And then we try and work out what language the book Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone is written in. And we only have the title to go on. We haven't got the whole book here. And all of the words in the title have frequency one, which doesn't really compare very well to the English language profile. So although it doesn't work, this is at least an example that's fairly intuitive and we can understand it. And you can see how it might well work if applied to longer documents. The model that we actually determined was best to use for language identification was a Bayesian model. And this is rather more incomprehensible. It's based on a Bayesian probabilistic idea that the probability that a document is written in a particular language is proportional to the probability of certain features arising in that language. And those features might be words or exams. And there's a fairly nasty looking piece of maths that goes with this. But really, you don't need to worry about the maths. The good thing about computers is that you can program the maths into the computer and the computer will do the maths for you. However, the Bayesian model is what we call a naive model because it assumes that the, the features that we are analysing, so the words or the engrams that we're analysing, are independent. And that's not really true, because if words are next to each other, the chances are they're actually in the same language. And engrams might even overlap, so they definitely have to be in the same language. So again, this is something that might be a drawback of the Bayesian model, and it's something we should bear in mind when applying it. To look at the Bayesian model in more detail, what we need to do is somehow build a model which tells us the probability that a given word belongs to a given language. Then, when we come across a title where we don't know what the language is, we look at each word in turn and say, oh, that looks like a Hungarian word to me. So the chances are this book's written in Hungarian. How do we go about building this Bayesian probabilistic model? Well, actually, it's a lot less complicated if we instead we think about it as buckets of words. What we need to do is find every book where we do know what language it's written in, rip up the title pages, just me metaphorically, not really, and put the words into individual buckets for each language. So we find all the books that are written in English, rip up the title pages and put the English title words into the English bucket. We find all the books that are written in Hungarian, rip up the title pages and put the Hungarian title words into the Hungarian bucket and so on and so forth 
for every language that we're interested in. It's important to remember that even if words in the title are repeated, we put each word into the bucket. So the buckets will contain a lot of duplicate words. This is what it looks like when we come to implement it using a computer. On the left hand side here is a screenshot from my computer. I have a text file for each language labelled by the mark language code for that language and each text file contains the bucket for that language. Here's an extract from the Swedish bucket of words or the Swedish text file. And if we zoom in a bit, we can see that for each word, we've counted the number of times that that word appears in the Swedish titles in our catalogue. Having collected the words in our buckets, we then need to build a matrix of probabilities. That is, for each word and for each language, we need to know what is the probability that that word belongs to that language. For a lot of words and a lot of languages, it's going to be zero. The word fish probably never occurs in a lot of Aboriginal Australian languages, for example. So the probability of fish being an Aboriginal Australian language is highly likely to be zero. But for words that do occur, we need to work out how many times does this word occur in the language and divide it by all the words that we find in that language. Here's an example for a German word. And this is an extract from the matrix of probabilities on my computer. And we can see here the German word. We have that word and we have a probability for various languages associated with it. Actually, I've multiplied the probabilities by a thousand here for the simple reason that computers do maths with integers a lot more happily than they do with decimal fractions. So the biggest number here for German is the biggest probability. But there's a small chance that this word might indicate an Italian title or an English title. And for all other languages, the probability we assume is zero. So there are some words here that occur in only one or two languages, and there are some words that occur in a larger number of languages. It's interesting that English appears in most of these words. It's first in the list just because the, the languages are sorted alphabetically. It doesn't mean it's the most likely language, but actually English does pop up a lot. And that's purely because English is the dominant language in the British Library catalogue. So the vast majority of the records that we've used to build our model, which will be in English, and this does give the model a tendency to over predict English. Again, that's something we need to think about when we're looking at the output. Here's a summary of the maths. Um, this is the proportionality that we are basing our model on. But as I've hopefully explained over the, the last few slides, although that maths looks really scary, all you really have to do is count words. And there's a lot of words to count, but computers are very good at counting and they don't mind counting millions of things. If we've built our model, how do we actually measure how successful it is? In this context, there are really two measures that we're interested in. Precision means how often does the model get the answer right? On the other hand, recall is, does the model find everything in a particular language? There's a trade-off to be had here. It's not really very useful if the precision is very, very high, but the recall is very, very small. For example, the model might retrieve four records and say, these records are definitely in Zulu. But if there are 3000 records in Zulu that the model's missed, that's maybe not very helpful. However, in this context, precision is more important than recall because we really want to get these language codes correct. We don't want to accidentally add incorrect or uncertain language codes to the catalogue. When we experimented with the Bayesian model, with uh, looking at analysing words and looking at analysing n-grams for different values of n, we looked at the precision and recall and we micro averaged and macro averaged, which means looking at the level of individual languages as opposed to looking at scores overall. And we found that an analysis of words was really the only method that was coming out with a suitably high precision. We also investigated other statistical models which came out with far, far worse results than this. So it looks like a Bayesian model based on analysis of words is the way forward. This precision is not really high enough. Um, we'd really like precision to be 99 point something percent, but at least this gave us something that we could work with and I hope that we could build the model and refine it. There are a few assumptions underlying our model and it's best to be open about these. Um, then, then we can take them into account when we're looking at the results in the model. So firstly, because we've built our model using catalogue records that do contain language information, we are implicitly assuming that all of that language information is correct. Now, if you work with metadata, as I do, you probably have a much more realistic and pragmatic 
understanding of the situation. But at least we hope that the number of language codes that are incorrect in the metadata that we've used to build a model will be a small percentage and it won't affect the model too badly. It might also be interesting to think about whether we can use this model to detect any incorrect language information that's already present in the catalogue. So for example, if we build the model and it turns out to be really bad at predicting Basque, then maybe we should go and look at the Basque language information that's already in our catalogue and check that it's correct because it the, the poor prediction of Basque might indicate a problem with the Basque coding in our catalogue. The second assumption is that catalogue records are monolingual. And this assumption is purely for the simplicity of implementing the model using a computer. Obviously, catalogue records are not monolingual. If you think of a bilingual dictionary, for example, both the title and the content will be in two languages. But our model here will only predict one of those languages. This is something that we might want to think about as a future development. So we could build a model to detect bilingual or multilingual resources. Our third assumption is an assumption about which parts of the metadata, which metadata elements, can we reasonably assume are in the same language as the language in which the content of the resource is written. And we decided that the title, edition statement and series statements were the elements that we could reasonably make that assumption for. That won't be true for all records and all resources, but again, we hope that the records for which it's not true will be a small proportion of the total. Finally, our model can't predict languages unless it's met them before. So if we found a book written in Martian and gave it to our model to say, what language is this? Because the British Library doesn't hold anything written in Martian already, it's never going to predict Martian and it might well make an erroneous prediction. So that's something that we need to be aware of. Here's an example of a, a catalogue record which um, is, is contradicting our second and third assumptions, really. The, the catalogue record here is not monolingual. It's written in a combination of Aranda and English, although from that title there, we can probably guess that the resource itself is written primarily in Aranda. And again, the title statement is half in the same language as the language of content, but does include some English as well. And something else that we need to be aware of is words belonging to more than one language can lead the model astray. So if we are the computer model coming to look at this record, we might start by thinking Higitus. Well, that's a Latin word. Figitus, that's a Latin word. Merlin, not sure about Merlin. I'll leave that one for now. Magic, well, that's English. Song, that's English as well. Or maybe it's Chinese. But just looking at the beginning of the title, the computer might really not be sure whether to predict Latin or English. But thankfully, there are sufficiently many distinctive English words in the remainder of the title that we can be fairly confident that the model will make a prediction of English by the time it's read the whole title. This title at the bottom, on the other hand, is much shorter. The first word is a distinctively English word, but it's not a very common one. And the second word, pi, crops up in a lot of languages, and it seems it's most common in Latvian. So the computer will probably predict this title is in Latvian, even though to us it's, it's obviously English. And that's a particular problem with short titles when one word can lead the model quite significantly astray. Now, we might get around this by ignoring short titles or being more sceptical of short titles. Or another approach might be to consider word bigrams or word engrams as well as individual words. So as well as considering cottage and pie as individual words, we're also thinking about the pair cottage pie, because I'm fairly confident that will only ever arise in the English language. And here's another example which might to contradict one of our assumptions. The language of the title here is Latin, but the place of publication is the Dutch city of Leiden. So can we really be sure that this is written in Latin or might it actually be written in Dutch? Well, generally speaking, the language of the title matches the language of the content, but we do know that with Latin and Greek, there's a bit of a tendency, particularly with historical publications, for people to put the, the title in Latin or Greek, even if the rest of the the book or perhaps the dissertation is not written in Latin or Greek. So for this reason, we've steered clear of making predictions about Latin or Greek unless we have some other information to corroborate that prediction. So, for example, if a book is a, a, a Latin dictionary or a Latin grammar, then we'll accept the prediction. But if we're just looking at the title, then we're not accepting predictions of Latin or Greek, however confident the model is. When we start to get some results out of our model, this is what they look like on the right here we have a picture which is, is termed a confusion matrix. The shaded cells on the diagonal indicate resources where we've got the answer right. So 
have we predicted the correct language? And any shading which falls off the diagonal indicates problems with our model. The figure on the left here is just a, a zooming in from the top left hand corner of that confusion matrix. You can see quite clearly there is a, a horizontal band here which matches up to this horizontal band here. And there's a lot of off diagonal shading there and that is English. As I mentioned earlier that the model will massively over predict English so this helps us to know that we have to be a bit skeptical of predictions of English. There are also slightly less distinct off diagonal bands here for French and German and probably lower down we'll find them for Russian and Spanish as well which are languages which are reasonably well represented in the British Library catalogue. Sometimes you can also pick out square patterns that are, are centred around the diagonal um, and these tend to indicate confusion families so, so families of languages that it's, it's easy to get confused. Examples might be Irish or Scottish Gaelic or languages such as Serbian, Croatian or Bosnian where the actual labelling of the language is as much a political issue as a linguistic one and the model might well get the language family correct but make the incorrect prediction about which language within the family is present. So when we are deciding which predictions to accept from our model we need to stay well away from those off diagonal shaded areas. And we do this by setting acceptance thresholds. To set a threshold that we say we'll only accept a prediction if the computer is more certain than that threshold that the prediction is correct. And because we know English is so poorly modelled, we set the acceptance threshold for English at 100%. We're only going to accept predictions of English if the computer is 100% certain that that prediction is correct. For other languages where the model performs much better and there's very little off diagonal shading, we might set the acceptance threshold much lower, say 95% or maybe even 90%. And then we come to look at the impact that this model has had on our catalogue data. Well, we actually worked in three tranches and each of those tranches, we've got a million records um, which we've added language codes to. So the, the confidence has decreased slightly, but we're still over 99% with a third tranche. And that tranche is currently on its way into the catalogue. We can't just stick a million language codes in overnight. We have to drip feed it in. Already, we're getting really positive feedback from our curators and our researchers. It's really helping our curators to identify their collection responsibilities more accurately. And our researchers are finding it easier to identify texts written in particular languages. On the right hand side here, we return to the graph that we saw earlier, but showing the increase in language codes in our foundation catalogues is bringing the average up. So maybe one day we'll get much closer to 100%. We're not there yet, we've still got a long way to go, but this is really making a, a huge difference to our catalogue so far. And another way that it, it's been really helpful is because curators are able to identify their collection responsibilities, the curators are then able to add more granularity than the model can. So, for example, at the moment, we have a curator who is very interested in identifying North American indigenous languages. And these are all lumped together under one mark language code, which is not ideal. But our model has proved really quite good at picking out North American indigenous languages. So we've been able to identify that group of records, which previously didn't contain any language information, present that group of records to the curator, and the curator can then use her specialist knowledge to work out which particular language is present within the resource. Just got a couple of slides to finish up with quickly. I've published a paper on this project in cataloging and classification quarterly. So if you want to see the maths in more detail, then you can go and access this paper and you can also get to it in the British Library's research repository. I also plan to put the source code on GitHub at some point in the near future. So if you'd like to use our model to analyze your data, you're very welcome. But if you do so, bear in mind that it won't be as good applied to your data as ours because we have built the model using British Library data. The best way to analyze your data is to build a model using your data. If you have any questions or want to get back to me for help with looking at your data at any point in the future, please don't hesitate to get in touch. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Victoria. Um, hello. <laughs> Thank you. That was absolutely amazing. I think I'm exhausted. Sorry. <laughs> what a project. Um, how large was the team or is the team working on this? Um, it's just me. Oh, 
Except I've had some wonderful help from curators with language expertise who've been absolutely fantastic about identifying and checking the results. So that's been really good under lockdown. I've been able to um, give people spreadsheets with lists of, of records in them and say, please could you check that these are really in Galician or whatever language yeah. it is. And if I may ask, um, how did you how did you start going about this? Uh, did you check with other projects and how um, a lot, done similar work? Or? A lot of reading, really, to start with. Um, it was something that, that we knew was a problem that we wanted to sort out, but we didn't know where to begin. So I just did a lot of, of reading around, seeing if there were any tools out there that were good enough. Obviously, played around with Google Translate. I'm sure a lot of people have done and, and discovered that well, it, it's okay, but it only has sort of 50 languages and there are 484 mark language codes, I think. So, And, and there are deb in. debatable results with Google Translate. Yeah. It's, it's um, pretty fun putting titles into Google Translate and seeing what comes out. Um, I think you may have started something. So uh, offering to help anybody who's, who's looking for it may have been a dangerous thing to do. Um, we have a couple of comments from uh, participants. Uh, Jenny says, fascinating. Thank you so much for this insight to big data applications to improving catalogues. Thank you. Um, and Philip is asking, were there no corpora or even probability sets for languages available that you could make use of rather than generating your own from your own catalog? If that's not a stupid question and if I haven't completely misunderstood this. No, that's not a stupid question at all. There are corpora out there, but the best data set to use is one that reflects the data that you want to analyze. So if we want to analyze catalog titles, then it's best to build the corpus using catalog titles. And specifically, it's best to build it using British Library catalog titles. Um, but yes, in some cases, we we've supplemented the corpus using OCLC records or taking online corpora if there were some languages that are really not very well represented in the British Library catalog and we needed to fill a few gaps in. Um, we've had one more question coming through from Vasha. How do you address items written in more than one language, like all UNESCO publications? Um, at the moment, we're just asking the model to give us one language, but at some point in the future, it, it would be really nice to go build another model to then run that across the catalogue and say, can you pick out all the, the multilingual resources, please, and look at those later, because we figure having one language code is better than having none. But it's definitely not as good as having all of the language codes. Yeah, definitely, absolutely. Um, Wasim is asking, um, did you analyse Indic languages as well? I'm not sure if it was mentioned, or Arabic script-based languages. Yes, um, I think some of the Indic languages are lumped together under one mark code. But yeah, any any language that has a mark code, which should be any language really, um, we, we've looked at everything. And if the record includes multiple scripts, then we, we've analysed those as well. I just think it's it's amazing and about time that we actually did all this work. So I think it's absolutely fantastic that you're doing this. Um, so many catalogues actually are missing things like language and it's really important. Um, uh, sorry, we've got a couple more questions. Oops, three more questions. Sorry, Victoria. Um, <laughs> So the first one is from Sally, just to say it was really interesting and very impressive. Thank you. Uh, Vasu is asking, where do you add this information in 008 or also in 041? And 008, and if we happen to find that we've got more than one language code, then we'll put it in the 041 as well. But that tends to be if a curator has looked at the record and provided more detail. So, um, and the final question before we should probably go to the breakout rooms is from Peter. He says, did you treat proper names differently from other language content? Um, well, we've not really had that many proper names because we're not including the controlled headings, the 100s, 700s, or the $245 C. There won't be that many proper names. Um, but yes, there will be some in the title and we, we aren't able to tell what's a name and what isn't. Um, so that's an example that can send the model astray. For example, there's a language called Karen. So titles that include the proper name Karen tend to get predicted as being written in Karen, but they're quite easy to spot because we only got a few predictions in Karen. So we could go and filter out the, the misclassifications. Mm -hmm. um, so um, 
we'll see if there's a question again about uh, the write-up. So we will send out the links that you sent to your article. Yeah, okay. you can find them in the BL research repository. You can just search. Yeah. Yeah. Feel free to email me because I know I didn't cover everything I said I was going to. So I'm quite happy to respond to emails later. That's absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to all our speakers for a fantastic presentations this morning.